Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm hoping you can all hear me correctly, and uh, if you can't, then uh, please do use the chat to let us know, but hopefully everything is in order. Um, I introduced myself, I'm Martin Pierce, I'm the bursa here at Selwyn College, uh, with my Dr. Mike Sewell, who's a senior tutor, who will introduce himself in just a moment. So, um, we're speaking to you this morning from our brand new Quarry White House Auditorium, uh, that has only been open for one month, uh, but we're very proud of that. Uh, and um, we'll take you through, hopefully, a few items of interest, uh, and we'll do that via the share screen function. Um, questions and answers, uh, you could use the chat function to supply questions and answers, uh, to supply questions, then we will answer them at the end of the session. Um, it will be recorded, so if you enjoyed it the first time, you can watch it again. Uh, and also, um, the presentation which we will show will be uploaded to the college website. Um, if you don't happen to think of a question during the session, uh, there will be an opportunity to also to send further questions in via email to admissions at cell.cam.ac.uk. Uh, that email address will be on the presentation as well. Um, so, uh, before we sort of get going in earnest, um, just to let you know that the, um, uh, that, that my, my, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what the being a bursar involves. So, really, in charge of finances, the operations, and the compliance. Uh, and Mike, you want to just introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Mike Sewell. I'm a historian by training. Turned off, I'm getting a message that says I'm muted. Is that right? Is that just my machine? Apologies to those of you on the line. Okay, yeah. Assuming it's okay. Okay, good. Um, I'm a historian by training, um, director of studies in history and politics, and as senior teacher, I oversee the academic and welfare provision in the college for our undergraduate and postgraduate students. Right, um, I'm going to wander over to the lectern, and uh, hopefully, our technical uh, expert here will also show you the auditorium. And uh, I'll kick off with the presentation. Hopefully you can see a nice picture of our stunning old court. Oh, sorry, I need to share the screen, apologies. I'm sorry, I need, to, I need some help. I don't know how to do that from here. Apologies for that. Uh, as you can tell, we are new in our auditorium and uh, we're still learning some of the technology, uh, but hopefully you do now have on your screen a nice picture of our old court, uh, which uh, is uh, the historic court built in the, uh, the 1880s. Um, and let's get, let's get going. Okay. Right, okay, this is what we're going to uh, cover uh, over the next uh, little while. They've been about finances, student finances, which have been changing. So it's worth, even if you know the basics, it's worth just uh, reiterating where we're up to. Uh, there's some Brexit related changes. Secondly, a little bit about the accommodation we offer here at Selwyn College. Uh, and then Mike will take us through academic and welfare matters and their relationship to admissions. And then we'll come back with a few other things that we think are just worth mentioning about uh, uh, Selwyn and uh, why we think it's uh, worthy of. Uh, 
your attention as a, as a possible uh, uh, venue for uh, your student studies. Okay, um, so a bit about the basics of finances, student finances. Uh, so first of all, just to look at tuition fees, um, this is determined essentially by the difference between uh, home status and overseas status. Uh, and until the current uh, academic year, home status has included all EU students as well as uh, UK, but this has changed due to Brexit. So for now, it, from 2021, this will include UK, but also Channel Islands, Isle of Man, also Republic of Ireland, and also importantly, any EU citizen who has settled status or pre-settled status in the UK. Uh, and it is actually also a requirement for all, including those with UK nationality, to have had three years residence requirement in the three years leading up to the start of the course. And that entitles you to, to, uh, to the uh, regulated fee for tuition fees, which is £9,250 per year. Uh, and you can borrow that. Uh, it's a loan that is not means tested. Everyone can take out the full amount and repayment is dependent on income after graduation. So that's one side of the coin. The other side is the living costs. So there are also maintenance loans available for home students. Uh, this is means tested in the sense that if you have a higher income, uh, you can only take a smaller loan. So next year, 2021 to 22, uh, the maximum is £9,488, as you can hopefully see there. That is if you have a £25,000 household income or less. Uh, and there can be extras uh, for specific situations, including disabilities or dependents, if you have dependents. Uh, and the minimum, it goes down on a sliding scale, where if you're at 62,000 household income or more, uh, then it's £4,422. Uh, those numbers change every year. And it's repaid in exactly the same way as the tuition fee loan uh, after graduation. However, there, are, there is help available. Uh, importantly, our Cambridge bursary scheme that applies to the whole university is being uh, enhanced from 2021. Uh, it is for uh, UK and EU students with settled or pre-settled status, uh, and it provides a maximum of three and a half thousand pounds a year if you have 25,000 of in household income or less, but with an extra thousand pounds per annum uh, where a student had free school meals, that's one of the enhancements. Uh, another enhancement is that the uh, range of household income has been increased, so it now goes up to 62,000 of household income, the same as the tuition fees, uh, and um, the same as the maintenance loan, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, at that point, obviously, it tapers to zero. There are also, importantly, college support funds. We make it our business to ensure that nobody it needs to cease or has difficulties with their studies because of financial issues. Uh, and the college does have access to a number of funds uh, available. And it can include not only where there is a, a shortfall, but also if there are bridging requirements. So sometimes the student loan company uh, doesn't uh, get its funds in on time. And uh, the student's tutor, and, and Mike will talk about the, the role of the tutor later on, uh, but the student's tutor, and this is a pastoral role, uh, is the gateway to these funds. Moving on to accommodation, one of the things that's uh, really attractive about Selwyn is that it's all on one site and there is accommodation available for all undergraduates. Every, every um, undergraduate who wishes to have a room in the college uh, may have one. Uh, and as you can see from the little map there, uh, the, the site is very compact. Uh, we've got uh, most of it on one side of the road, Grange Road, and uh, then we also have our Crips Court on the other side of the road. Uh, and um, basically everybody is uh, accommodated in in one of Old Court, there are historic rooms there. Uh, Cripps Court on the other side of Grange Road, which is originally 1960s, but was fully upgraded uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and also our new Anne's Court, which has been built uh, also in the, in the 2000s. And if you look at the map carefully, there's also a few little houses there, uh, and they also accommodate uh, our students, but they're very much part of the site. So um, importantly, um, there is no sharing, uh, there are no shared uh, accommodation and 64% altogether is en suite, but most immediately for most students arriving, the most important thing is that all the freshers are together in Cripps Court and all the rooms are there are en suite. Um, also good news in terms of the payment for um, the accommodation is you only pay when you're here. Um, so 30 weeks of the year uh, is paid for. And the weekly rents uh, next year range from £116 a week to £196. And it's important to say this is there are no extras, there are no hidden extras. 
uh, it includes utilities and broadband uh, and there are no kitchen fixed charges some colleges uh, charge uh, a sort of minimum to uh, support their kitchens we don't do that there's also an option to stay in the vacations uh, it is subject to availability but we wouldn't reasonably uh, unreasonably withhold uh, and you can just pay the extra rent at the same rates as the uh, the 30 weeks mentioned above at that point i'm going to hand over to uh, mike who's going to talk about the academic and pastoral matters thanks martin um so as a tutor um one is looking after students not in one's own subject so each of our um, students, undergraduate students, has a. Let's move the slide on, Sandor. It's, there we go. Each each of our students will have a pastoral tutor as well as a director of studies. Director of studies, someone in their subject, oversees the small group teaching, oversees academic progress, but then. The pastoral side of things is dealt with by someone outside subject and who therefore can be the critical friend without the student ever feeling that they're compromised inside their department. And the tutorial role covers advice on a massive range of subjects, some of which um, Martin has just alluded to in terms of uh, permissions to stay outside the usual times of residence or uh, financial issues or navigating university bureaucracy, health issues, mental health issues. The tutors are often the point of contact that can say, well, go and talk to that person or let's um, take this up with Student Finance England and so on and so on and so on. So the tutor who stays generally with uh, the student throughout their undergraduate career builds a relationship. Each tutor would have about 40 or 50 um, tutorial pupils on what we call their side in all and they'd be across all three years or four years and therefore they really do build a good working relationship as do the directors of studies. So this is a very personalized um, approach which is augmented by the college's provision of a chaplain who um, although um, um, he is a chaplain, he is a, a Church of England uh, figure, our current chaplain, um, serves all faiths and none in a pastoral role out with the tutorial system. We have a nurse who um, is on site um, five days a week in, in term time. The tutorial office staff who deal with many of the administrative things for students are often a good first point of contact if a student's got a problem. Um, and our college porters or security who are on um, site 24 seven um, throughout the year also um, will be supportive of students and can help students and guide students with advice in a crisis or just if they're feeling a little bit lost or at the start of their career, perhaps a little bit homesick. Add to that the wealth of peer-to-peer -peer support that comes from the fact that students live together in the, the Selwyn community. And this means that each individual feels supported each individual is going to have lots of um, people there for them and in addition of course like all of the colleges we have access to the range of university more specialist support such as the disability resource center or the university counseling service or other such bodies which are intercollegiate and university funded and which can do the more specialized things and the tutors are often the the the, the guides who say well for that um, assessment for a specific learning difficulty, I'd go to the Disability Resource Centre, um, but for this particular sort of thing, we'll talk to your GP, or for that, we'll talk to the University Counselling and Wellbeing people. Our retention rates are very strong. If we fall below 99 or 98 and a half percent retention over the four years, uh, we begin to think that there's something going wrong. And that's partly a reflection of our academic excellence and of the high quality of students who get in through our very competitive applications process but it is also because there is a lot of support and a lot of uh, well-being um, activities and people who can give the students the, the appropriate support at any given point in their career and a lot of that comes from the fact that as Martin was saying we're on a single site 
there is a very strong sense of community. There is a very strong sense of belonging that all students get drawn in. And I think that it's safe to say that all of our students really rather quickly find their own niche. It's been rather different this past year because of living in households um, where contact with other households has been more limited, but the sense of community nonetheless is very strong. The sense of belonging provides a feeling for all of our students that they can fit in, that there isn't a problem for them. And that community is based on the principle of residence. Our postgrads um, are um, also residents, some of them in Cripps Court in adjacent staircases to our freshers. Um, I've mentioned the porters and the atmosphere that comes from that is very strongly supportive. We want our students to be ambitious. We want to inspire our students to be the best they can be. And it's great when in recent weeks results have been coming through and some of our students have been top of the entire university class list in a variety of subjects. That is at the heart of the Cambridge education. And yet the sense of community provides the, the rock, the base, the foundation for them to aspire to do that. And for them to inspire one another and learn from one another in the informal context of the college. Occasionally students with really exciting to them dissertation topics will own up to their director of studies that their friends have asked them to please stop talking about the dissertation over dinner every night and give it a little bit of a rest. So they can then come and talk to their director of studies who will get that bit more excited uh, on a prolonged basis about something in their subject. So people belong and people are involved in the college community in a range of, a, of, of extracurricular and co-curricular activities, subject societies, uh, for example, in the co-curricular sphere, or one of the first things that happened in this auditorium in which we're speaking was a music society event, or a, a, a college um, lecture organized with a prestigious external speaker. And that, as well as the more informal things, give the richness of college life, which we try actively to foster in this college. The, associate, the associative life in the college also helps contribute to the very high employability and very good career prospects of our graduates, as well as the teaching and learning that's gone on and that trains them for responding in writing out loud in group sessions or individual sessions with experts. The fact that they can organize um, a ball or the fact that they can organize the um, student common room or the sports clubs or the debating clubs or the music society and so on gives our students a range of experiences that give them I think a range of different qualities and skills that they can carry forward along with their academic qualifications. But the academic qualifications are at the heart of what we do. The university provides the lectures, the seminars, the practicals, the language classes, the field trips when they resume um, that are at the heart of any university course. It also sets the examinations. But additionally, the Cambridge colleges provide the small group teaching. You can see an example of a law supervision going on there. One teacher, two students discussing the students' work around a particular topic. And students would have one or two supervisions a week on average. So that's personalized feedback on their written work or problem sheets in some of the more mathematical subjects, as well as the opportunity to say, well, I didn't understand this in the lectures. Can you give me a bit of help? Can you give me a bit of guidance? And that academic support is rooted in the role of the directors of studies and the supervisors. In Oxford, the people who do the same role are called tutors and the supervisions are called tutorials. The two universities basically do the same thing, but can't, can't agree on what to call it. Sorry about that. We get it right, of course. Um, but the director of studies and the supervisors, students may abbreviate director of studies to DOS, which not all directors of studies like, um, give that very personal support. There's a lot of feedback comes through this. You meet your director of studies at least at the beginning and end of each term as you do your tutor. And there's a review 
of progress. There's a, an analysis of what's gone well, what's not gone so well, where do we need to put a bit of extra help in. But equally, the, the essays that students write write are commented upon and discussed in supervision. The thing we all learn quite quickly is the one thing you have to be careful about if it's a paired or group supervision um, is not to praise a student too much in front of their mates. They get very embarrassed, we know about that. They can take a bit of criticism, but please don't tell me it's great, not in front of my friends. This helps our students get a load of life and career skills, as I was just implying. There, are, there is a deadline for the piece of work in supervision. There are regular supervisions. So in my subject in, in, in history, it would be a supervision a week per paper where we'd expect people to do two and a half, 3,000 word essays based on the reading they've done that week from a reading list that we will help guide them through. They learn to work under pressure. They learn to have discussion where they put their views out there with someone they know to be expert in the topic. And quite often we'll find students come back to us after a job interview, how did it go? Oh, it was nothing like a supervision with Dr. X. This, the interview was so much more straightforward. And they've learned that skill. So it's not just about imbibing the knowledge and the precise skills of how to solve a particular problem in, in the way of that course, it's also more broadly about learning to develop one's fuller um, professional self, whatever one's subject. And the standards are high. The expectation is that our students should be capable of getting at least an upper second class degree. Over a third of them, um, something approaching half of them will, will at some point in their career get first class results. And we, we are always delighted when that happens. That does not make us all that unusual, though it does make us above average for the colleges. The teaching is all informed by the research. The directors of studies um, are active researchers. Dr. O'Sullivan, our law director of studies there, has written one of the basic taught textbooks, T-O-R-T, um, that is used in this and other universities. The research informs the teaching right from year one, but especially in year three, or in those other triposes that do four-year courses in year four, especially with projects and dissertation. So this is an open day. We're talking about admissions, but I needed that context because that's the only way properly to understand the admissions procedures that we use. Sometimes people ask us a lot of questions on these occasions about choice of college. You'll notice, that doesn't feature here. We talk about choice of course. Get the right course. If you want to be parading on graduation day, that picture was from last week where we did some in-person but distanced graduations. If you want to be in that parade, choose the right course. The course that will be academically fulfilling. Don't just think about it as a route through to a job, but think about it instead as the thing that will allow you to fulfill your academic potential absolutely to the maximum in the following three or four years. So we're assessing, are people right for the course and is the course right for them? Are their problem solving and thinking skills the appropriate ones and at an appropriate level? How do we do that? We look at students' track record. We know that GCSEs and other equivalent examinations in the last year or so have been somewhat disrupted, but we can still look at academic track record relative to their cohort, and we're looking for the potential to thrive on our courses. That's why Cambridge operates a more intensive selection process than other universities other than our friends in Oxford. We will look at people's admissions assessments, whether taken at the time of the interview or whether taken before interview as an indicator of potential to thrive on the type of problem that the course they're applying for will require of them. We will interview students. Now the interview isn't about personality, the interview isn't about social skills, the, the inter interview is not about um, culture or handshaking ability or eye contact ability or all the things that the mythology would have you believe. It is about can you do the problem solving? Whether it's the maths, whether it's the literary criticism, whether it's the sort of logical thinking that's required to do the philosophy degree, that's what we're looking for. 
This is not about having quotas for particular types of people or particular types of school. It is not about social engineering. It is all about suitability for the course applied for. One word that I would make is that there's sometimes a little bit of confusion, I think, about the statement of most common or standard offers. And sometimes people will say to us, I was predicted or I've achieved the standard offer. Why didn't you make me an offer? And we have to be honest and say the standard of applicants is so high that the standard offer is the basic benchmark, but that the vast majority of our students achieve above it. We've just had our international baccalaureate results for our offer holders, and most of them have achieved 43s and 44s and 45s out of 45. On average, our A-level products will achieve between two and a half and three A-star grades at A-level each. So in a way, the standard offer is the bottom benchmark, essential, but not of itself sufficient in terms of the competition for places at Selwyn College, Cambridge. And also some of you may have heard stories, read stories, there was a very good one actually in the Financial Times just the other day, which highlighted that one of the things is that Cambridge hasn't really increased its number of undergraduates in the last 50 years, but the number of people applying has risen markedly. And the graph here charts 1977 to 2020, Selwyn application numbers. The number of places on offer has varied upwards, perhaps from about 100 or 110 to about 120 or 125. But that's not the same scale of growth, especially the growth of the last 20 years or 10 years that you can see there. So the competition for places has grown. Not receiving an offer from Selwyn College, Cambridge is not a failure. It is a measure of competition for places. But don't let that put you off, because what's the worst that then happens? If you're going to get the grades that you need to get into Cambridge, the other UCAS choices you can make are all going to be prestigious universities with world-class reputations. So in a way, it's not a high stakes game. It's nice if we can get in, there's a lot to offer, but it's not Cambridge or bust. It's not Cambridge or nothing. And we would discourage people from feeling that way. But that's just by way of context to, um, to be quite clear and transparent about the scale of the competition. So we've moved from three or four applicants per place on average to six or seven applicants per place on average in the course of the last quarter of a century. I think we're now back to the bursar. Yes, we are indeed back to me. Um, okay, so uh, we've talked about a number of things which are definitely Selwyn related, but also could apply to uh, wider student and Cambridge experience. Um, now, it's, it's, a, it's a great pain to us that uh, we cannot show you around the college today. And uh, of course, we would love to be in the position to do so. And COVID has been uh, a real pain in that regard. Um, but let me just talk to you a little bit about some of the things that I think and we think uh, are reasons why you might want to consider Selwyn in particular. Uh, one of the things uh, that we have is uh, up, very up-to-date uh, catering facilities, uh, because we're very aware that uh, for student life, apart from all the academic uh, part of the life, just where you live and what it's like to be here uh, is really part of the mix and is part of what make, will be, make people feel at home. And what you want is for students to very quickly feel at home both because they, we want them to enjoy their time here and secondly, because once people feel at home, they will feel much happier about focusing on the academic life as well. So in terms of our catering, um, we have a new servery, uh, which sits next to the historic hall that you can see in the picture at the top here. That was uh, uh, built in, in 2018. And there's very good quality food around five pounds per day, both lunch and dinner. There are always three choices. It always includes vegetarian, of course, other dietary requirements, and we have many different dietary requirements, all recorded with uh, the catering department, and they are all provided for. It's not a problem. Uh, one of the things we have done in recent years is also open the hall up during the day so that if people want to pop in, have a coffee, snacks, etc., uh, then uh, it's available. And indeed, that's been true through COVID times as well and, and continues to be. 
Uh, normally in um, term time, we also have two formal meals, for, formal dining uh, twice a week. Uh, that's a three course meal. It's served uh, with coffee. Um, and uh, somebody asked in the in the chat about the subsidy. So there is a subsidy involved in, in all this. Our formal hall, certainly uh, it costs about 14, 15 pounds. It, it's definitely a, a subsidized at that level. Uh, and also the servery, servery food as well. So um, you people will only need you don't need to come to the hall you don't need to come to the servery uh, but if you do it will be probably the most value for money option also even more recently we opened our new cafe bar uh, in 2019 uh, that's open from 12 noon every day and is all open all afternoon and evening uh, there's coffee and snacks as well as uh, alcoholic and soft drinks and it's been very popular except when the government has required us to close it, which has always been um, painful to us, but it has happily been open for the last few months again. Um, other things, uh, something's very central. I mean, uh, interestingly, when uh, Selwyn was built in 1882, it was right on the edge of Cambridge. And indeed, uh, we, uh, the college bought some farmland in order to develop it. And there was nothing if you went west, uh, apart from more farms. Uh, that, these days, that's very different. We're right in the middle of academic Cambridge now. So first of all, right next to the college, and there's even a gate that goes between them, is the Sidgwick site, which contains a number of the arts and humanities faculty, including history uh, and also economics and law and divinity and uh, English as well, and the languages. So uh, that's right next door and also incredibly close to the university library. Uh, it's probably less than five minutes walk. And for the sciences, the new West Cambridge site is also incredibly nearby. Uh, transport around Cambridge, it's a reasonably small uh, city uh, and certainly students will do almost everything right in the middle. Uh, and it's cheap, it's easy to get around a lot, uh, you know, by reputation, a lot of people cycle uh, and, uh, and walk as well. Uh, we also have a, an on-site college nurse, so it's part of the pastoral provision and we've re recently increased ours. And just one thing which I think is incredibly important is it's a large site, Selwyn, it's a, it's a, and it's got some really beautiful gardens which aren't entirely obvious uh, underneath this text, so perhaps that gives a better idea. Um, this is very, I think, a very relaxing feature. There are places to go if you want to be quiet within the college. There are places to walk around, enjoy, and it just gives the sense of spaciousness and relaxation that I think helps, uh, helps the students. Last and not least, uh, the building we're in. This is the new library and auditorium. The auditorium that we're in is on the ground floor here and the library is the two floors above it. Uh, and uh, just to give you an idea uh, as to what they might look like inside. So um, at the top, we have our new Bartlett Library, so new that you can see there are no books on the bookshelves. We are literally about to start the book move from the current library, which will take the next month. Uh, and by the time uh, our uh, students return in October, uh, both floors of the library be fully stocked with the books. Um, I should add that um, this is a panoramic and therefore it isn't actually circular tables, they are straight really, but it just gives you an idea of the, uh, the uh, size and uh, scale of it all. And uh, as for the auditorium uh, underneath, um, this is uh, it's in its opened up state. So if you look behind me, you can actually see something that doesn't look like it's on that picture. And that's because it's something known as a sky wall, which comes down from the ceiling and separates the two halves of the library, uh, the auditorium, I'm sorry, and then the screen comes down in front of it. So it can either be a big space or a small space, and the seating you can see also retracts to make it an even bigger space. So it's very, very fluid and very uh, flexible. And uh, we're very proud of both of them. Uh, they have, as I say, been only open for the last month or so. That kind of brings us to the end of the presentation piece. Um, There's one question in the chat, which hmm. relates to what he was talking about, um, which is to do with what provision there is for self-catering at people level three to the community. Limited is the arts answer. I mean, one of the things about the college is we do regard ourselves as a communal institution, and indeed it is the collegiality and the association that Mike's already talked about that's really quite important. And part of that is actually eating together. So we do encourage people to come to the, the surgery. There are a number of options. You don't have to come and sit with people, but often you find that you just happen to sit next to somebody and end up, end up striking up an interesting conversation. It is the, probably the best value approach. We do provide uh, kitchens. Uh, we call them jip rooms. They're sort of mini kitchens uh, in each of the landings. So in crypts, you would find that each of the corridors has uh, a, a kitchen area. Um, we don't 
provide ovens. There are there are hog tops and there are toasters and kettles and uh, microwaves. Uh, and what we would say is that that's really best for light snacks, uh, but not really um, to produce your own four course dinner. So uh, we do provide some facilities, but um, the main opportunity for a, a sort of full meal would be in, in our servery and and hall. Okay, I'll uh, we'll come down. We'll stop sharing the screen and then we'll be able to take your questions between us. And um, do, do keep feeding through uh, questions in the chat um, during the talk. There'll be one or two that we'll be responding to to the, to the particular questioner. Uh, but there's one um, that has come in, which is uh, about uh, guidance on choice of college um, versus course. And are there preferred colleges that are more beneficial than others of course and i think i'd go back to one of the points that was in the slideshow where i said we focus on the course about 25 or 30 percent of selwyn students some of whom are some of our highest performing students some of whom are some of our most ardent and enthusiastic uh, student ambassadors came to us through what we call the pools after the december round of interviewing um, and then again in August on a smaller scale, um, students who near missed but are really well worthy of a place uh, are offered by the other subscribed colleges in any given course for consideration by those who consider themselves that year undersubscribed. And that's not newer, less well known, is in one category and older and more famous is in others, Trinity College and King's College and Commonwealth and Keys College and some of the old city centre colleges are just as much pool users and contributors um, as, as we would be. So it's about this year we've got a little bit more that we can fit in given our numbers so we'll pull somebody or we've got slightly fewer and we'll go and look in the pools and therefore you shouldn't obsess about is the college right for me because there's a reasonable prospect that you might concede that we end up at another college. And amazingly, as if by some magic, when the offers go out, people start to feel, I'm really glad I didn't go to that whole other college. This one's much nicer. I could kid myself, that's because of the personalities and the North Bursary School Tutor. Um, unfortunately, I suspect it's actually because we made the offer. So I wouldn't say, obsess about college, I'd say get the course right. If you're unhappy on your course, it doesn't matter what college you are in. If you have a bit of a falling out with some of the people in your college, your course is right, things are still okay. The exception to that might be if someone has mobility problems and therefore, even in a relatively flat case, a city like Cambridge might want to be proximate to their department. So that sort of consideration obviously is rather different. But more generally, I don't think trying to choose a college and then, as it were, gaming the choice of course is, is a profitable way forward. I would encourage you to get the course right. And then you can either make a choice of college or do what's called an open application. And then there is an algorithmic process for the allocation of open applications that takes place three or four days after the 15th of October, and where students are allocated to a college which, relative to its historic levels and across the board in that year, is relatively undersubscribed in that subject compared to its usual standards. So it's not a random reallocation, it's an algorithmic process that has to be tweaked at the margins to get the right outcome. Martin, do you want to take one? Yeah, there's a good question about the size and facilities. The question is how much difference is there in the size and facilities between the possible and top price rooms, and also how much say there is in which price bracket you will be in. Um, so the uh, essentially, yes, there is a difference in, in size, as you might imagine. Um, there's also the main facility that is dif that differentiates the higher from the lower is the ensuite bathroom. So I mentioned 64% of the rooms are on the suite of the college. Uh, the remaining 36% will tend to be slightly down the lower end, although that can in turn be offset by, for example, having uh, large rooms in the, in the upper corner, which is nice. Um, in terms of, uh, say, in uh, 
which end of the bracket you're in. Well, uh, it's let's say we've already mentioned that our pressures we put into the Crips Court it has great facilities, they're all en suite, uh, people love being together. Um, as they're all en suite, they tend to be at least at the higher end of the uh, price bracket in the first year. But in the second and third years, we operate a room ballot system where people in advance can seek to share, room, share rooms that are neighbouring their friends uh, that they've made in the first year. Uh, and uh, that means also that they are able to determine uh, what sort of price of rooms. And in, in particular, I mentioned that we have some uh, houses on site that where students live. Those tend to have a variety of room types in them. And so sometimes groups of friends where you've got some people who are happier at the higher end of the spectrum and others are at the lower, they get paid off for those houses because they can all live there. Um, and basically in the second year, it's kind of random which order you're in and then people who get near the top get first choice. And in the third year, uh, we, we reverse it. So the people who were the bottom of the second year choices get to be at the top of the third so to be there in the end. Uh, so of course, in the second and third year, you have quite a high degree of choice about what sort of room you want to be. I, I think two things emerge from that that Martin's hinted at um, earlier, but which become relevant now. One more Martin will be. Um, so the hostels, the detached houses on the main site, um, actually mean that those students who want to do a bit more self catering will gravitate there because they have slightly bigger kitchen facilities than the. Uh, corridors and staircases. The second point is that this way, uh, in, in terms of affordability of rent, if a student runs into unexpected financial problems, uh, the tutor will help and student college funds can be available for a student who runs into hardship generally can't afford things because of other unavoidable circumstances, such as changed family circumstances or whatever that affect the anticipated flow of income. Um, and that, that there's a bursary. Um, question, which um, must I don't know if you do that um, now, and then we'll come back to, to Scotland and academic support program. Yeah, I mean, in general, uh, the question is, is about whether there are bursary awards outside of means testing, uh, because it, it looks like if income is over 62,000, there are no bursary awards. So, uh, our main focus, in, not only in the college and across the university, is to make sure that people have access to a Cambridge education uh, that isn't curtailed by financial considerations. So the main focus is on supporting those on lower incomes uh, to be able to, uh, to come to Cambridge. Um, there are some other uh, criteria around music, sport excellence, but they tend to be small scale, like you may know more than I do, but they're likely to be, uh, they're, they're probably not as significant and sizable as the Cambridge bursary scheme is. Uh, that's the there are some things there. That's absolutely right, Martin. Um, the, for the, the music students, one point that's uh, worth making is that those who study music have a piano in their rooms. So they're allocated, their rooms are allocated slightly differently um, from the rest of the students so that they have um, an instrument to work on as part of their academic studies. That generally means that musicians live on the ground floor, you can imagine. Um, the, uh, the, the sports and instrumental um, music, um, there are uh, funds that are made available for those who achieve high level university participation or international participation um, in, in sport, and they are relatively limited. They would be um, to help with the costs of lessons for the musicians or of um, participation um, for the sports people, but would usually cover full cost. Um, and similarly, those who sing in the college choir will get some singing lessons as part of that deal. Um, but generally, we're not one of those universities, this isn't really someone specifically, we're not one of those universities that thinks that we need to chase students with those sort of very specific um, funds. You know, if you are excellent at this, you will go on to um, get, get this scholarship regardless of need, we prefer to target what funding we have on the basis of need. Um, the question that came in about Scottish students uh, applies more generally to students who are not 18 at the time of arrival. Um, so do we take students under 18 or do we encourage gap year? Um, and there is a specific COVID dimension I can see as the question suggested to this, but more generally I think we won't depart much from our usual 
expectation, which is that we prefer our students to be 18 either at the point at which they begin their course or shortly thereafter. And shortly thereafter, for medics and vets, by law means by Christmas, because in January they start seeing patients and they must be 18. Um, more generally, we can just occasionally be a bit more flexible than that, but it's interesting that um, the questioner has talked about um, um, maturity. And I think that is the issue. This isn't about age, this is about readiness to study in the collegiate environment and get the most we will pull out of it. So we generally prefer our students from whatever background to be 18 at the point they start the course or shortly after, thereafter. But we don't operate a blanket um, ban on those who are going to be turning 18 during their first year. A uh, question about do we offer an academic support program alongside the main academic course? Um, those will generally be course specific, so that, um, that, that there are specific courses alongside uh, what departments offer that are relevant to, to theirs. We have a study skills tutor and we have a writing tutor who will offer bespoke help if students need a bit of an extra topper. So that will go case by case rather than course by course. And I think the other types of support um, we would make available through collective provision across the university. So the University Language Centre offers um, for those not studying modern languages um, or those studying who want to pick up an extra language if they are doing modern languages, um, some certificates and diplomas or non accredited courses that will result in a Cambridge certificate um, that you've studied the foreign language to a particular standard. And those are voluntary, and the college makes a contribution in that case to the cost of the course, about half the cost um, if a student completes it successfully. So there are parallel study opportunities, but not usually systematic ones. The terms are short, the work is hard, the terms are intense. So we try to slightly discourage some of that type of extracurricular or co-curricular activity. Little from uh, Mike about um, uh, what, whether there's any additional college support to help with um, ensuring that everybody's applications are. I think that, with all due respect to anyone who's at school who's already providing a lot of, of, of support, um, we don't necessarily feel that that support always adds all that much, except maybe a bit of confidence at the margins. And I think if any school that isn't offering extra support, um, feels worried about that, they should contact our admissions office um, and the, the admissions at cell um, address that was on one of the slides and discuss that. There is, there is provision online if you look at the Cambridge HE Plus resources. Um, they, there's a lot of, of, of enrichment uh, material there. Um, I'm just trying to multitask and because I'm a man and not very good at it. HE plus. Um, I will once I stop talking look up the um, web link for the HE plus site. A lot of enrichment material there. And I think the advice I would give to anyone about the application is make sure that you have someone who is um, you, you know, a graduate one of your teachers or um, someone who's, who's been through university to overlook the personal statement, make sure it's clearly written and grammatical and that spelling's been double checked or triple checked or quadruple checked. Um, and that also then you practice discussing academic matters conversationally outside the classroom setting. And it doesn't really matter with whom, it's just getting used to talking for 20, 30 minutes about why you want to do a subject, about some technical things about the subject, about what makes the subject interesting, so that you can then have um, 
a, a great confidence going into interviews. There are um, university provided um, interview films which give a very good, I think, I'm in one of them, so I shouldn't be so boastful, but uh, a good a, a, an, an accurate feel for what interviews are like across a whole range of subjects. Certainly to the interviewers involved in those films, it felt very real. And we used offer holders who were post qualification but hadn't been taught by as yet as the interviewees, and they said it felt like very real as well. So again, I'll post a link to that. A bit of web surfing. So we're coming towards the uh, the end of the time. If anybody's got any further questions, uh, and we'd like to come on chat, we will go to answering them. Uh, if there aren't any further questions, then uh, as a reminder, if you want to send an email after the session, uh, it would be to admissions at cell sel dot cam that's c a m dot a c dot u k and as i said earlier we have also put the presentation up on our website so you can look at that and we will also record this session technical difficulties and everything not seeing any further questions unless anybody's got one uh, then um, I think we would very much like to thank you all. I do hope this has been informative and useful for you in giving some extra context both to Cambridge generally and in particular around Selwyn College. Uh, and that if you have any further questions, you'll be able to direct them to admissions at cell.camp.org. Mike, any final words from you? Um, I, I think a um, comment on, on the, the school support which has come up in, in the chat. And I, I think that, that we, we appreciate the level of support varies from school to school. And I'm sure in the session that our admissions tutors, if you attended it yesterday or the one that they're doing later today, um, this will have been covered or the one that our school's liaison officer uh, did earlier this morning, um, also will have covered it. One, one of the things we do in considering applications contextually is that we look at how a student performed relative to their cohort in their school in their year and therefore that helps us to know how to adjust our expectations and sometimes some students or teachers or parents from schools that perform very highly feel that this is a form of social engineering Yet when I talk to teachers from such schools, they also will acknowledge it's something that they rather do with their feeder schools. So uh, they do acknowledge that it's something which is a feature of the British educational landscape, but we do things contextually and holistically. If someone's had seriously disruptive educational trajectory beyond the COVID disruption that everybody has had, um, there is a special form, the extenuating circumstances form, used by all the colleges um, that asks for, for some more detail, validated by the school, about the nature of the disruption. That is often personal illness, bereavement, family problems, but it can also relatively commonly be school disruption. School went into special measures, subject teachers leaving for whatever reason. Um, in double quick time um, during someone's GCSEs or during someone's um, um, year 12 course, for example, can feature in extenuating circumstances form. And I think it's perfectly legitimate for a candidate in the um, supplementary application questionnaire free text box or for the school in um, uh, an ECF, extenuating circumstances form, or for the school in an email to the admissions office to say, look, we do not provide that type of support. There is a tick box on the supplementary application questionnaire about that. And therefore, it, it, we do take this into consideration. We also have data on the number of Cambridge offers and number of Cambridge confirmed places that a school has in recent years. So that again, we can adjust our expectations of any given student. And I think that is important to 
reassure you that we're not admitting people on the basis that they've got some veneer applied by school preparation, whereas someone from the school down the road doesn't. We do think we can see through a good deal of that if it is just veneer to the true quality underneath, which may be true quality of the very well prepared, or maybe the true quality of someone who's benefited less from preparation. Final thing I'd say about it, I'm conscious I've said a lot there. Final thing I'd say about it is that just sometimes I will find myself and colleagues will find themselves talking to someone that we end up thinking was slightly over prepared. And forgive a football illusion, it's a little bit like the football coach that prepares his team to be confident or the football coach that prepares their team to be scared. And sometimes too much preparation scares the candidate. And they're so busy thinking about what not to say or what they've been told they must shoot on in, come what may, that actually they don't listen carefully to questions. They are not themselves. Now, what we want is someone who listens carefully to questions and answers the question precisely. And if that involves saying, I don't understand that word, or can you give me a little bit of um, guidance as to what it is that you think is going on here, or someone who, when we give a hint that they may have gone slightly wrong, takes the hint, runs with it, that's good before. Someone who gives me a perfect speech that they memorized and recites an interview, hmm, not sure that that's going to impress me if it's not absolutely spot on relevant to the specific question that I asked them. So preparation can take you to a position of feeling more comfortable and confident, but I don't think you need to worry too much that it makes the crucial difference. Doesn't matter how well prepared an interview is, if the rest of the academic profile, and particularly um, the holistic view of the profile, doesn't incline us to a positive outcome. And there is a lot of stuff on the university website that gives guidance there. Martin has been busily um, giving. Uh, various answers whilst I was conscious of typing whilst I was talking. I think, we, I think we've answered all the questions that have come up on the chat. So, um, uh, as, I said, as I said, there's an opportunity if you can comment something or we think of it afterwards. Please do go and get in touch and one of my, myself uh, to answer as soon as we can. But again, thank you all very much for joining. Um, appreciate your time. Uh, I hope it's been useful and informative. And although uh, it's always uh, disappointing not to be able to show you around in person uh, uh, due to COVID, nevertheless, we're mindful that uh, the web is a powerful tool at enabling people to uh, avoid image trouble long distances, but still get the benefit of seeing uh, what we have to say. Thank you all. And thank you for the questions. Perfect. Thank you very much. And we'll let you get on with your day.